Hello and welcome to Design Chat, the best live design discussion on the internet. I'm your host, Ryan McGovern. On Twitter, I'm at Hoobajoob and at Design Chat. Every week we get together, we bring together some of the coolest people from the design community. And tonight we have for you, uh, Miss Jessica Hish. Hello, Jessica. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Fantastical uh, this evening. It's so good to see you. Um, we had the pleasure of meeting uh, after the STA event some weeks back in Chicago, uh, an event for which you were a judge, uh, and that was very fun. I get to hang out a little bit, so um, it's good to see your face again. And you popped in on a chat. Oh, bravo to you, popping in on the end, end of a chat a couple weeks ago. That was so awesome. Um, I want to encourage fun. more people to do that, yeah. Um, so great. Um, we've got you for a full hour, and this is going to be very entertaining. I promise you, for a number of reasons, which will be revealed in the near future. But um, first of all, for anyone who, for whatever reason, uh, does not know who you are and what you do, tell us uh, a little bit about your history, uh, who you are, what you do, and why you do it. Sure. So um, you guys know my name is Jessica, obviously. I went to school for design. Um, I went to Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. I ended up in illustration after I graduated because I worked at a place in Philadelphia called Headcase Design and I got really into doing illustration while I was there and also when I was in school. And then um, after I, I was in Philadelphia for a bit, I made a promo to send to a bunch of designers. Um, I ended up sending one to Louise Feely and she called me in for an interview and offered me a job. I moved to New York. I worked for Louise for two and a half years, and that's mostly where I honed my type skills. And then in September of last year, I went full-time freelance, and that's what I've been doing since. You have been quite popular in the last year or so on the sort of talk circuit, if you will, making the rounds. Uh, you've made quite a splash. Uh, with the work that you share with people, um, the things that you can share. So that makes me wonder even more, like, what what are the projects that you can't share and what isn't being shown? Because we got a great we got a great comment this morning. I should bring it up on on your uh, the post we made uh, for your show, um, and it came from a fan uh, a fan it, it, you know a contributor at this point. His name is Gerific, um, and he phrased it perfectly. I'll, I'll read it back to you here. At the it's at the bottom of the blog post. Um, which got crazy traffic, I'll tell you about in a second. It says, Gurifik says, in total awe of Jessica's talent, most creatives only excel at just one discipline. Jessica excels in both typography and awesomeness, plus drill-worthy illustration. And I think you said that perfectly. Well, I'm happy to excel at awesomeness. I think that is my favorite title so far. Awesome Accelerometer or something like that. <laughs> um, it's official yeah, it's, and you I should put it on your business card. I should. I should. That that's my new title. Uh, other, other than like cat obsessy, like general creative person, awesome awesome person, as said by <laughs> Design Chat. But um, yeah, um, I kind of think of myself as a specializer, even though um, a lot of people think I wear a lot of hats. Um, I think compared to a lot of designers, I'm I'm pretty specialized because I think I'm sure there's plenty of you guys out there that are web plus print plus motion plus animation plus flash development plus like <laughs> intern to eight people so I think you guys are more of the the people that can do a bajillion things and I'm I'm the one that can do just a couple things pretty pretty good well you bring up a great point and it's a subject that comes up a lot in in that um, designers today young designers are being asked to wear a lot of hats Whenever you see a job uh, description, it's this crazy list of, of these talents that it seems like so few people actually have all of those and are proficient in all of them. Because guess what? It's impossible to, to be proficient in all of them. So it seems like you've taken a path um, that's a little bit more um, intelligent in that you completely focused on one thing and you became excellent at it, just like you're killing right now. And therefore, probably, and um, you've you've confirmed in high demand. Yeah, I, a lot of people don't have the luxury to like kind of specialize in what they do. Like especially when they're young, they just kind of have to take what they can get. Um, but because I had a full time job, that I was pretty specialized at my full time job. 
um, I was able to be a little bit choosy um, with my freelance projects as I was working. So it geared my portfolio um, in this specific realm rather than kind of taking every project that came my way just because I was like starving for work. Um, I think it's one thing that a lot of people don't do. Um, they, they think I want to be a freelance designer so they just branch out on their own without really having kind of a a posse of clients to really go from and I think um, one of the best things that you can do is while you have a full-time job work as much as you can and you you have the luxury of kind of like refining your client list and your portfolio because you don't you're not like it's not your bread and butter it's not the thing that's paying all your bills it can be the thing that you do to uh, specialize to like put yourself in the right path Hey Jessica really quick uh, do me a favor under your mic sensitivity under your your image just tap it down a little bit. I'm getting a little bit of a buzz, um, and I think we'll be okay. That's better. Yeah, good. Um, forgot to announce at the beginning uh, a couple things. Um, this is a community forum, right? This is a forum where anyone can show up from anywhere in the world and get involved in the participation. This isn't just about me and a guest talking. This is about you guys. So. Um, questions, ask questions, ask them in the chat room, but more importantly, there's a little button uh, right above the chat room with a light bulb that says questions. Um, you can either submit a text question or a video question, which means if you have a webcam, you can get on video tonight and ask Jessica a question face to face. And I think that's a really cool point of what we're doing here is that you can be anywhere in the world and be part of the larger community. So please, 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 I saw one question pop up already. I'm so glad to see that. Please ask more. We're going to start um, taking those questions in just a little bit. Um, okay, so first uh, order of business is I saw a number of tweets from you today that led me to believe that uh, you had a rough day. That uh, you know today yeah, was it not was, it was, the easiest of days for you. It wasn't the easiest of days. I am currently refinancing my apartment. So I had to go to Bay Ridge, which is very, very far away, um, to um, sign some paperwork. I rented a car to do so because if I took the train, it would take like an hour and a half. So, and I got down there and the numbers on the contracts were all wrong. So I basically took a half day off of work, rented a zip car for $60, and now I have to do it again on Monday. So it was a, it was a bad start to the day. Plus, I was a little worse for wear this morning because the... SPD spot illustration party was last night and Brian Ray bought me a bunch of drinks and it ended up being a, a little bit of an evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, consider this your therapy session uh, and the design community is going to help you heal uh, in, you know, inside and out and you will be glowing with, with glee afterwards. So. Um, everybody send positive vibes to Jessica right now because that, that sounds like a very <laughs> difficult day. Um, well, okay. just long. Uh, I'm, so, I'm on so, a plane tomorrow, so. Well, we're going to help you get yeah, through so that. Um, do it, do it. Delay. <laughs> so the blog post that we put out there um, on our site and then that got echoed also on Abdezito, which is a design in inspiration blog. If you guys aren't familiar with, with it, they're friends of the show, check them out, abdezito.com. It'll pop up in the chat room just uh, in a second here. Um, crazy traffic, Jessica, crazy, crazy traffic because people just absolutely drool over the images that you're able to create for your clients. Um, you know, it's this great relationship that you have to have with them to be able to, you know, make those things happen time and time again. And in, you know, the relatively short amount of time that you've had working so far, you've amassed this crazy body of work, a really impressive body of work. Um, on the heels of that, other tweets that I've seen you post recently have indicated that you are going back to type school. Please tell I us am. why. The reason is, is because uh, type design and lettering are really, really different. So I mostly, what I do is lettering. So everything that I do is kind of a one-off. I get hired by magazines or whatever to, um, you know, illustrate one word. And it's not meant to be anything more than that one word. I'm really interested in making fonts. And I can throw a font together as, like, I released a font this week. But I really wanted to um, go to a program that could basically teach me the right way to do it so I'm not just kind of 
like feeling around in the dark trying to make a font and then all of a sudden somebody downloads it and there's some mistake that I couldn't find that I would have found if I knew what I was doing. Um, but I, I, when I released Buttermilk, Buttermilk did great and I was really psyched on it. It took a very long time and I know that with type design there's probably like a handful of tricks that I just need to be taught in order to do it quickly because it was like that for me when I graduated college with Illustrator. You know, I I felt like I was doing it wrong for four years and then suddenly I, I learned like one trick and it was like, oh, I understand, I know how it works now. <laughs> um, so, I feel, so I feel like type will be like that for me and I just want to make it so that I can make fonts and not have to take like five months off of work in order to like make a font or something. You know, I want it to be something I can do for fun. But uh -huh. um, I've actually, um. there weren't really ever any type programs in the US before. Um, most of them are in the UK or there's one in the Hague that's really awesome. We like learn how to cut type in stone and whatnot. And that seems super badass and I really want to do that, but I can't, right? Like I don't really want to take a break from my freelance work right now, like a full break to go back to a full-time program. So the, the program that Cooper Union set up is actually just perfect for me because it's meant for people that, you know, are working. Um, it's two nights a week. It's not a full-time thing. It's not an MFA, but I don't really need an MFA. I just... I just want to learn. I don't. I don't. I'm not into the, the formality of it. You know. We uh, we brought up this school uh, a number of weeks back. We had Eric Speakerman on the show. Um, we're very lucky that he had traveled to you to the U.S. and you know the time difference worked out. And, and uh, that week we brought up that this school had just uh, popped up really. And this is the first year. This is the first semester. It's about to kick off very shortly if it hasn't already. Um, the Coop, at the Cooper Type Union um, in New York, this is the only program of its type in the U.S. Um, and which it's great that it exists, um, but I think it's a shame that it's the only one. Um, I can't wait to vicariously, in whatever small way that I can, live through you and you, what you're about to go through. Um, I would imagine that on some level you're going to be sharing various things as you as you go through the program. But I really, my hope is that people see the productivity that comes from something like this and more of these schools pop up. Right, well the thing right now is that um, like type design has been always such an old man art for years and it's only very recently that people started getting really into it in the kind of more formal way. Like a lot of people were making like crappy free fonts forever, um, you know, or like the low budget ones like like, it looks like it should be in a haunted house, or this is made of, like, scrawly type or whatever. Um, but there's not, there weren't a lot of people that are young that are making, like, really functional fonts. And I think um, social networking and, and the internet has had a lot to do with kind of making type designers a little more in the public forum. Um, because it's one of those things that, like, as a designer, you don't really realize how big of an impact these type designers have on your life because you're the one that's like winning all the awards but they're the ones that like made all the parts for your awards <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is a great point um, also that uh, the, the, on the subject of what you're bringing up is that the internet is so young and, and the digital uh, methods of creating type are so young um, a measure of that is that uh, Google just had its 14th birthday. Okay, it's 14 years old. Um, it's not really a full-fledged teenager yet. Um, did the digital way of living, right? Um, and something that uh, a guy who talks a lot about social media, Gary Vaynerchuk, likes to say is the internet is still in its teens. It ha it hasn't even had sex yet. What happens 20 years from now? Yeah, we're we're in we're in a maturation process, and I think that's being reflected in what you just said. Um, we're also going to see the maturation of type design in the digital landscape. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of it, like uh, a lot of type designers even still use Fontographer, which hasn't been, I think it was very, very recently updated, but it wasn't updated for, you know, years and years and years. And to, to think of the fact that, um, you know, Adobe updates their software like every nine months or something like that is, which is ridiculous. But um, people were working with this like five-year-old software and it takes, you know, a couple years to really like not to figure it out, but to really get a handle on it. It's the same way with any of the programs. Like you, you can kind of know what you're doing, but you, you're not proficient at it until you've been doing it for a couple years. So to think that, 
you know, people were working with these kind of outdated programs, having to run like different OSs just to run their font making program or whatever. So it's like since Font Lab and since there's another there's another program called Glyphs, which a, a type designer started developing, um, that kind of stuff has made it much easier for people to actually make typefaces and. Uh, because of sites like MyFonts and, and these font distribution sites that are like super popular that all designers go to, more people are encouraged to make typefaces than they ever were before. Plus, who, who doesn't want passive income? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, and again, a subject that's come up on the show before, you know, there is this new way of earning money that not everybody quite understands yet or is comfortable with. Because as growing up, our parents and our grandparents always tell us these stories about, you know, understand the meaning of a hard day's work and earn your dollar and you've got to be grinding away every day. Um, but the people who are becoming very successful right now understand more and more that it's about working smarter and not harder, right? There are more proficient ways of, of accomplishing things. And that's an example of one. You can earn passive income by creating a digital sort of service or, or, or a product, if you will, and then distributing that. And it's empowering people like you. And that's, that's very exciting to see. And it's one of those things that I think designers are just now kind of keying into because um, licensing for illustrators is has it has been a giant part of the industry for years and years and years and that's actually how most um, successful illustrators really make any money like or have children and do things that aren't involving working until two in the morning um, but really it's not like fonts are kind of a thing that designers can grasp because they say like I am licensing this font I need it for X amount of computers um, but with illustration I mean you're licensing every time that I do an illustration I'm not giving away the rights to that I'm licensing it for one month or licensing it for however long they're paying for it and based on how they pay me that uh, really has a giant impact on the price so um, what a lot of illustrators are trying to do is make these kind of not necessarily products but you know making patterns making illustrations, making, uh, you know, alphabets and stuff like that, that they can license over and over and over and over again. And that just kind of like is a way for you to slowly accumulate um, another form of income so that you can eventually not work until two in the morning or, you know, you could send your kids to private school or, <laughs> you know, actually have real success in the industry and, and just not work yourself to the bone. Um, I mentioned it when you hopped on the chat uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, you have a wonderful page on your website in your about section um, that's you know the commonly asked questions and of course those are not the subjects that we will really cover tonight of course because they've been covered and you've been interviewed I don't know how many times already um, but if people uh, everyone should go there um, it, it's a great summation of, of your thoughts today it's a great summation of, of, of sort of who you are and, and really it's like one of the first times that I've seen that um, because we've had a number of people on here before who get interviewed a lot and, and talk about design a lot, you know, in these circles. And it's my goal anyway. Like, like I strive to like stay away from those questions. Like, what's your favorite typeface? What inspires you to design things? You know, like you can only hear that. The, crap the so what's much your what's you your wanna... inspiration is the one that is just like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess on the, on the heels of that. What's the question you get most? Um, that's probably one of the biggest questions. Like, um, a lot of people write me for recommendations for typefaces or for books. Like, a big thing is people write me and ask me for book recommendations. And to tell you the truth, like, I don't actually have like a giant um, collection of design books. Um, Louise has an unbelievable collection, of course, because she's married to Louis, or to uh, Steve Heller. They have a separate apartment for all their books. But um, I mostly just like whoa, 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 only whoa, really whoa, 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 stop. They have yes. A, say that again, please. In New York, a place where apartments are so hard to come by and be comfortable with, you just said they have Stephen Heller and his wife have a whole apartment just for their books. Yep. It's crazy. You, so you just blew I, my I, mind. I, That's insane. It's, I know, like in the middle of Manhattan as well. Like they're like Manhattanites too. So it's crazy. But they've been living in New York. This since, is like, a this is a place I, I want to travel to to go see. It's gonna be like that's gotta be like the designer's mecca of of printed knowledge. 
I believe it. I mean, Louise would bring this stuff to the office and you would just like, because she would find, oh, I found this album in France 15 years ago full of these tiny embossed seals that are beautiful and they all have type and there's thousands of them. And she's like, oh, I found it for $10 at a flea market. It was amazing. And I'm just like, oh my God, please let me somehow make my way into your will so that I can have these at some point <laughs> or just give them to me because I want them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not only not only the the uh, sheer mass that has to be there if it takes up a whole apartment, but um, the idea that those two people um, were the ones who um, decided what went in there, you know, like what what gets better than that? Like not much, really. Yes, Taylor, if, if in the chat room, like I a, am drooling. This is amazing. Totally. I'm taking notes right now because this is something like, I'm sorry, like it totally took the conversation off path, but I'm fine with that because because this is something that I think everyone needs to know and hardly anyone does. Only the people like you who have had like direct interaction with them know those sorts of things that that even exists. And you know, the, you know what, I take, it to, I take all of this back. Uh, Stephen Heller, I'm sorry. I'm about to let the cat out of the bag and spread word to the entire internet that you have this treasure trove, an apartment full of design greatness in New York somewhere like that should be a check-in on Foursquare I want to check in there like I want to go there right now <laughs> if only if only I would I would be I, I would the be badge. tweeting from there at this moment I need to collect myself I'm like I'm like getting flustered about it that's insane okay um, okay so another subject I wanted to bring up uh, is Doug Bowman is the creative director at Twitter um, and he's done a number of really interesting things uh, since he's sort of had power there. And we bring up Twitter a lot. We're not going to get into the we love Twitter conversation. But he, he in an interview, he recently um, revealed a, a fact about the new Twitter that's just come out that I finally friggin' mm -hmm. have. It took too long. Um, I, I hate you. I, I love you, yet. Twitter. Uh, I... There was a little bar at the top. It was hard for me to see. There's a little bar that says, would you like to try the new Twitter? Uh, so if you don't have it yet, make sure that when you go to Twitter.com, you look at the top, the bar on the top that says, do you, do you want to try this? Anyway, he revealed that um, the, uh, oh God, I'm totally forgetting the name of it now. I, I hate it when I do this. I blank on the show all the time, but that's, it's the beer. Um, it's the perfect, uh, uh, the perfect square, the perfect um, ratio was used to design the layout. It's it's that shape that's that perfect shell that we see in, in nature and math um, and everywhere around us. It surrounds humanity and it's, it's a pleasing uh, sort of ratio of shapes was actually used to lay out the new Twitter. Um, which brings up a subject here for you, you know, in in thinking about design and thinking about layout and thinking about things that you do, are there methodologies like that? Are there like, cause that's like a core principle. That's something that not just design, but all of humanity understands on multiple levels in science and math and all this. Are there core principles of design like that for you that you keep on finding yourself going back to? Um, well, I'm actually the opposite of someone that uses the golden ratio because I don't believe in designing like mathematically. I find that you, you see a lot of design because people, um, you know, they're like, but the measurement was right. It's exactly five millimeters on the top and on the bottom, you know, and it's like, yeah, but optically that doesn't really work. Like that's not what it is. So I'm more of a like squint and make it work visually than I am a follow directions kind of person. Mm hmm. So I like that's like um, the, are, the biggest thing that I took away from from school was just like blur your eyes and it should look better, <laughs> like move it around with your eyes blurred. <laughs> well, see, that is a methodology then. That's you know that's great because that's just that's a system that works for you and um an, a, a, a sort of conversation I've been really interested lately is the idea of about learning about learning that there are you know there are things that work better for other people because everybody's wired differently. And we're learning more about how to teach people things and how to absorb them. I had a very great experience. Uh, if you checked out uh, the show last week, um, we did a live broadcast um, from the CUSP conference. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting, uh, moving experience. If you ever have the chance to go, uh, um, Design Chat is actually a media sponsor of the CUSP conference. This is how it breaks down. Symbolic, which formerly Simona Mason, which is where we um, broadcast from every week, 
they put on a design conference. This is the third year that they did it, and it's Cusp Conference, and it's called the Design of Everything. Um, and so it's it feels a little bit like like TED in a way. Um, you know, they call it the Design of Everything. It's not like a typical uh, stereotypical design conference where it's just the design superstars and everybody drools over their work and tells them how much they love them. It's a thinking man kind of place. You know, it's uh, like for instance, they had the the founder of the TED uh, Talks. Richard Saul Werman uh, was one of the speakers um, and said every word that dropped out of this guy's mouth was like crazy knowledge that anyone's going to be a better person for hearing. And one of the great things that he said is um, you only know something relative to something you already know. So the, I, the foundation of learning anything is that you already have this like pre-existing knowledge. And it's one of those thoughts that just blows your mind and makes you reevaluate um, how you absorb information. So after that long babbling, you know, workup, Jessica, what's the best way that you learn things? Uh, what are the methodologies that work best for you to absorb new information? Um, I'm more of a, I'm like a doer to remember things. I, I used to kind of cheat learn in school all the time because I'm really good at quick memorization, but I just don't retain it if I do it that way. I would just rewrite things over and over and over and over again, and then I would remember them that way. But really the only way that I remember things in life is if I do them and then I have to show them to someone else. So uh, the classes that I did the best at were the ones where I was just like excited about the information. I would be like, did you know that all this shit happened and blah, 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 and then I would have to tell everyone. I would never have to study for those tests just because it was just like interesting and I felt like teaching it to other people. That's a great, you know, I, 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 that makes a lot of sense to me because, and I think a lot of creative people, I think a lot of designers um, rely on that method because it's storytelling. It comes back, the people who are really successful at design are, are successful because they can tell a story through visuals. You know, idea one leads to idea two, leads to idea three, which turns on the light bulb and you get it and it's a moving experience, right? Um, what were the things growing up that were difficult for you? What were the challenges that you would face as a kid? Um, I was incredibly shy probably until my parents got divorced and then I kind of had to, you know, be a real person and not just be like a, a quiet girl that cried after everything. But um, the, one of the biggest challenges for me was I went to Catholic school and everyone was super vicious and just trying to, I, I never really learned to, you know, be my own person early enough. Like my, of course your parents like tell you like, you should be yourself like don't follow other people but that doesn't really work so it took me a really long time to kind of find myself and not be like a horrible follower popular girl like the cusp of the popular girl that sort of gets invited but then gets ostracized at the parties and stuff <laughs> so i mean really socially uh -huh. that was see this is like a real therapy session this is amazing i know i know that so that was the like i i, I didn't really have uh, trouble with work stuff when I was in, when I was growing up, like my biggest problem was trying to fit in so much that I just like didn't work and I didn't have to study and I could still get like B's and stuff and I thought that was fine. So it really took until I got to college that I started really working very hard. And, uh, and that's I think just because I was taken out of that like horrible social situation where I cared about being important in my friend group. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen sooner or later. We have a request in the chat room. Uh, these hands are electric. Wants to have oh, you wait, show us your tattoo. Look at that mm. type. It's just gorgeous. On your gun, have, no less. I have that one. Check too. out my guns. That's the other one. The process. Love it. And then um, here's another one. It just keeps on going. Is there is a, a total going. count? How many do you got? Yeah. Four. Um, I got I got a tattoo recently, and it's really amazing. Um, I want to share it with all of you. I I knew that the subject was going to come up, so I, I, I prepared. I, I printed it out. I want I want you guys to tell me what you think about it. It's like my favorite thing ever, and it like it inspires me. It's you know things I. It's a dream I had really. It was a dream, and um, I you know one day I just hope it comes true. So it's moving. Um, I thought you might you guys might like that. It's it's very important to me. Um, you know, actually, that's bullshit. It's, it's, that's not on my back. Um, you know where that image came from, Jessica? Is, is uh, <laughs> um, 
So when when we got to hang out when you were at the STA event, we already kind of talked about this last yeah, time yeah. we were on, but you were passing out these Justin Bieber tattoos. It was like the funnest thing ever. Like you had found it on, on some magazine. You had to have it and you were obsessed with it. And all of a sudden, like that became the topic of conversation all night. Um, and then I don't know if you noticed it, but I actually you did. I saw you retweeted Justin Bieber got on Twitter tonight and said he's going to come on and propose to you and, and you know, ask for your hand in marriage. So ha, ha, he's ha. here and he, he, he's brought you some gifts and it's, it's probably a really big ring in comparison to his size if you're looking at the ratio here. So, um, oh, look at that. Aww. That's so special. We all have Bieber. Double rainbow it's your fault that I am obsessed <laughs> with Bieber now. I want oh, yeah. you to know that. I think you're more obsessed than I am. I was just obsessed with, I was more I, obsessed with the Twilight tattoos than the Bieber tattoos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's embarrassing and I'm admitting it publicly, uh, live on the internet and forever on a podcast. Um, I don't know anything about him really. It's just that he's, he exists and that's amazing to me. Oscar in the chat room says, Ryan, stop drinking. Sorry, Oscar. Sorry to disappoint. That's not going to happen. Um, but people in the chat room, you should be asking questions, and we're going to take some of those questions right now. We're going to uh, bring in the text questions. If you have a chat cam, please ask a video question. We will have you on. Why would you miss this opportunity? Um, Gary Holmes wants to know, Jessica, what is the most challenging part of lettering? Um, hmm, what is the most challenging part? The, actually, the most challenging part is getting clients to understand that the pencil is not what the final is, really. Um, I constantly have to send pencils to get approved by like a lot of people um, before I jump to the final. And the, the biggest thing that's challenging is them seeing something in the pencil that they don't see in the final. Like they'll be like, but there was way more line variation in the, in the pencil. And I'm like, I drew it with my hands. That's why there's line variation. Um, so that's the hardest part is kind of the disconnect between the pencil and the and the final, or also getting art direction on lettering from people that um, don't hire letterers a lot is really hard because people um, mm -hmm. will say like they're trying to get a certain feeling or um, that something is really 80s looking, and I'm like I don't understand how it's 80s looking because it's based on like a French 1940s script, you know. So um, that's the the hardest part is trying to pinpoint their direction and figure out how to resolve it. This is a challenging subject and one that comes on uh, very often. Um, and it's, it is that client relationship uh, in you know, a lot of these times that we're dealing with someone who's paying us to create something for them. Um, and on top of that, they, they haven't had a lot of experience talking about visuals and what they mean and what they mean to other people and, and skewed perspectives and all, all these sorts of things. What is the worst client relationship or problem that you've ever had? Um, I, have, I haven't had a bunch of terrible relationships, but I get super like anxiety ridden when I get really long emails from people. Um, like, so if someone sends me back an art direction email and it's like, like this long, even though they're all very tiny changes, I'm like, I need alcohol right now. I cannot read this without <laughs> having a drink in my hand. And uh, <laughs> that's probably like the, the hardest one is like, is or people that are phone talkers and they just like want to get you on the phone and talk for like 45 minutes about literally nothing. Like they give you no art direction. Um, they just needed to connect with you five times a week for the duration of the project. <laughs> that, that is, yeah. That's tough. Not that I don't like um, talking to people Eric, on the phone. Eric Johnson uh, doesn't want to talk to you. Uh, he wants to know, can I steal some of your <laughs> techniques? Yes, because I don't do anything fancy. I just do the, the most <laughs> basic things possible and got really good at doing them quickly. So you are more than welcome well, that's to really use the pen tool all you want. <laughs> Brilliant. It's really interesting that you say that because um, it it's always it's always difficult to transition the way that you feel about your piece of work to how other people are going to view it and understand it, right? Um, and you know, a lot of us deal with the problem of we create something and instantly 
uh, we hate it, right? It's 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 hard it's hard to let go of that sort of personal attachment. Um, is that something that I think it's something that everybody deals with at, at one time or another, and usually it's like closer at the beginning stages of when you're learning how to create some visuals. Is that something that you've had to deal with, and, and how did you deal with it? Um, I have had to deal with it less than I think some people because the busier you keep yourself, the less you think about that stuff. So if you kind of, like, I am such a procrastinator, but I think it actually really works for me because I work better when I have less time. Um, so if I give myself four weeks to do something, I'm going to redraw it like 80 times because I'm just going to hate it every time that I do it until right when it's due and then I'll be like, oh, it worked, it's good, okay, send it off, send it off, send it off. But um, <laughs> so for, for me, like my biggest thing now is, is seeing a lot of people that are doing similar stuff to what I'm doing and being like, oh, they're doing better stuff or I should do something different than this scripty type or, you know, I did this last week. Why do I keep getting asked to do the same thing over and over again? So it's more that me me feeling like I'm I'm getting trapped within certain styles and, and wishing I could branch out, but then also being afraid to branch out because I'm less good at that than I am, of, of course, of the stuff that I'm well-versed in, so. Um, you had, in your... Uh, sort of about page you were talking about how um, you know your specialization and, and that you have people ask you to uh, recommend fonts and typefaces and that's something that you don't feel you're very good at um, because the, the things that you deal with are very much display typefaces right they're very ornate they're big they're expressive um, on that note um, are there are there like core typefaces that you go to for body copy, you know, like the Massimo Vignelli uh, sort of school of thought where you only need four or five typefaces to get through design, you know, and only those core, you know, Bodoni and, and Garamond, only those typefaces should ever be used for anything. Do you have like a school of thought on that for body copy at least? I think that, you know, people fall in and out of love with typefaces, um, you know, you'll, you'll love one, like, who didn't love Gotham forever? And then all of a sudden it's like two everywhere so you can't even use it other than like in little tiny bits. And then uh, same thing with Archer. Like I loved Archer. I was using Archer on everything and now it's like super overused. Right now I love Sent Sentinel. Apparently I'm like only obsessed with Jonathan Hepler fonts because those seem to be the ones that like once you spend $400 on the font, you use it as much as humanly possible. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> But um, I learned of a, a few good ones when I was working for Louise, too. She's a fan of Wallbaum, which is a really nice font um, for body copy. Um, I generally like body copy fonts that have good italics that come with them. So if they have a good italic, I like it. So that's one reason why I really liked Archer when it first came out, because I think the italic is super. Does it feel like a more full-bodied typeface if it's versatile like that? Well, for body copy, it needs to be because you're going to be, you're never just setting the body copy. Like, you need to be able to do italic stuff. You need to be able to do, um, you know, kind of small cap stuff when you need it. Like, it needs to be able to work at a lot of different sizes and not just, like, get blown out when it's too small or be too chunky when it's too big. And that's why, um, like, their typefaces are just awesome because when you buy one, you get, like, 80 weights and, you know, every italic and... Um, you know, they make all these alternate characters and all the numbers are crazy good and it's just really nice. Somebody had left a comment on the blog post about your show that um, uh, they, they really enjoyed your, the icons that you made for the doc icons for all your programs. You, you had designed a set of icons that were simple and gorgeous and much prettier, prettier uh, for you than, than all the crap that usually sits in there. and. Um, they were at the commenting on it. They they loved it. So I pointed them to that site, uh, the page of the site that you have them on, and then at the bottom of them there, I discovered a little jewel, and that little jewel that you provided for everybody was a tutorial on how you created them. Now, in the th other yep. things that uh, I've seen that you've done online, um, I haven't seen tutorials anywhere else. And this, uh, not even ten minute little video that had was a screen capture of what was going on on your desktop was poignant, clear, uh, descriptive in every way it needed to be. And at the end, you popped up a little video of your face and it was like this perfect little design lesson from Jessica Hish. When are you gonna do more <laughs> of those? Cause that was rad. 
<laughs> I would like to, but I can't. I can't give away all my secrets. I have to figure out what secret I feel like giving away next. <laughs> Certainly That's not the, trick, the uh, it? make it not make it look like cut paper and and ribbon type because then like my holiday budget is just totally cut. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll have to brainstorm for uh, you know more more projects for you to do that on because it's something that um, you know it's 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 a more sort of popular way of communicating right now and sharing your expertise and you know the idea of we're not competitive anymore. We should be sharing these ideas to make everybody better. Um, but the way you did it was just amazing and really like I would. I would gobble those up. Seriously, I would like watch every single one of those and copy everything that you do. Eric Johnson, if you're listening, uh, let's help her out with that. He wants to copy you. Um, okay, so uh, we've got another. We've got three more questions in the chat room that we're going to get to. Uh, I'm not seeing any video questions, people. I'm really disappointed. Get on video, please, please, please. Uh, text questions. First one uh, from um, what in the world kind of name? Akron. Oh, I've seen this one in before. It's just hard to say. It's like Akron, Acro, NYC, AKA Nadia. I'm just going to call you Nadia. What arenas did your self promo slash portfolio pre graduation, graduation piece concentrate on? I have no idea what that means. If you can interpret that question, uh, go ahead. I am going to dig out the link. If you, I posted all the former iterations of my website on. Um, oh, yeah. And I bet I could find what my promo was. So I'm going to be a nerd and type we need, right now. We need like uh, working music or like uh, uh, Jeopardy music for when, when we need to do this on the show. I need like a soundboard. Or Jessica can just sing to us. <laughs> if I like I, I kind of thought that that would be a really funny way to do <laughs> video of uh, if does, like I sing at my desk when I'm alone in the studio. So if if all designers just like took like video of them singing while they're working, we'd be like, but singing songs. <laughs> I thought it would be really funny. <laughs> There's a series of portraits that um, I think was released in the last couple of years of people playing video games, and it's just their face and the expressions that they make while they're playing video games, and it's sort of like a commentary on where like digital media is today and how it affects us. Have you seen that? That's brilliant. No, I haven't seen it, but it's amazing. It's horrible oh, and it's amazing at the same to this time. Because it's all flash. Oh, it's all flash. So here's um, what I'm gonna do. No, it's okay. I can link to this, and then that should be the pop-up window. It's flash though. This so is a unique experience, it. audience members. I hope you're paying attention because what you're seeing right here is Jessica Hish problem solving right in front of your very eyes. <laughs> um, and then the last, I think the last one says like body of work or something like that. And that's how you get to it. Let me see what I can do here. Awesome. It says body promo. Oh, the flash is all funky right now and doesn't feel like working. But whatever. It's on there if you get it to work. This is amazing. Thank like you for that. sharing that. <laughs> Um, so my, my was focused coming... just mostly on my student work, you know, student work, and I tried to do illustration for my promo, and that's what it that's what it focused on. Um, another random finding that I found today that just I think everybody should know about. It has no, uh, it does not pertain to this conversation whatsoever. Um, stumbled upon a website today called CarStash.com. Um, you can buy a mustache for your car. That's really what that is, and it's it's amazing. Carstash.com. Um, everybody should see that. I wrote it down today in my notes. I just had to share that. Um, now your car can have a Halloween costume, and I think that's amazing. Um, so everybody should do that. Um, looks like somebody's trying to make a live video question. Paul Stoney, yeah, you're the best. Um, Andrew, confirm that if you can for me. Um, all right, this is an interesting question. So we're going to take it. What the fuck? And Twitter asks, have you ever fallen in love with an ampersand? Um, I don't think I've fallen in love with one, but I do have a favorite for sure. I'm more of like the this kind of ampersand. The one that's like a back, that's like a, 
like an like E. A three it looks or, kind of like an E. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rather than the like classic ampersand, and I, those are the ones that I draw the most. To reference another tweet, uh, thank you for your question. What the fuck? I love your name. To reference an, another tweet uh, that you put out, I think it was today or yesterday. Yes, I'm totally stalking you and reading every tweet that you put out. Um, you had an for. interesting story <laughs> up about an and um, and a binary code and love. Uh, what was that story? The story was I um, received an email from a girl that I think asked me for a tattoo design or something, which I don't do um, for people that are not blood related to me. But um, she followed up with a really funny story about how she said something that was nerdy and I was like, oh, nerdiness, love it, love it. And she wrote back that, oh, I work at Apple and a couple of my friends work at Apple and they're getting married on uh, uh, 10 2010 like 10 10 10 because in binary code that is an, an ampersand. So, and I was like, that's the best thing I've ever heard. So I tweeted. That is the most brilliant, nerdy, wonderful way to express love. Uh, I, I've never <laughs> seen a more uh, exact way of doing so. Um, and, and on the topic of nerdiness, uh, something, so it's something that you talk about quite a bit, how you nerd out over things and you, you show pictures of your working space and all the different tools that you use, all the different monitors and gadgets and everything. Um, it kind of seems to me that nerdiness is just sort of turning into a way of exist existing and sort of like um, just being able to communicate on a, on a digital level. And to me, it almost seems like that understanding of nerdiness is sort of going to go away. Like just being able to use all these different tools and things that you plug into your computer is just going to be a way that we come we become literate. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you like do you feel like you have to hide some of your nerdiness, or do you? I mean, obviously you you show pictures about it, so you sort sort of put it on display. I mean, we're like, do you is that going to be a tattoo like rocking the nerdy like hardcore or something like that? <laughs> I don't think I'll get it as a tattoo, but I'm uh, I'm pretty proud of my nerdiness. I think um, thanks to the internet and the design community and whatnot, um, it's not like a, a bad word to be a nerd. You know, I'm not like a like a D and D person that is extradited from the community <laughs> for being like socially awkward or whatever. There's a lot of socially uh, non awkward nerds now. Um, and I, I am definitely like the most technology crazy person in my illustrator friend group, but th they just come to me with all their questions and, and I like it. And my boyfriend, I'm at, actually at the SVA interaction design studio right now and totally clogging up their work atmosphere. I think they're all probably mad at me for talking out loud. But um, <laughs> so my boyfriend Russ is, <laughs> my boyfriend Russ is in the program here. And uh, so I like that I can nerd out with him and that he tells me all these like awesome weird technology things and I can be like oh, that's so exciting I want to do that even though I don't want to do that because I'm happy doing what I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it, it, it is this sort of language that we have now you know and it's because I mean I'm, I'm exactly like you said earlier tonight um, when you find out that one little thing that changes your understanding of how you interact with that program all of a sudden, everything else is possible, right? You can work faster. Yeah, your images moments. are going to look better. Exactly. And it, it, the light bulb goes off, and, and the way that you create things changes forever at that point. Um, uh, in that same light, do you get hung up on only creating things in certain ways and just knowing those methods is how you do that one thing? Or are you always trying to absolutely learn everything that's new? I'm less like into learning new methods at doing what I'm doing and more into learning like new things that are around and like like end results that I don't necessarily have to have a part of but my work can be a part of like I'm not a Wacom tablet user I don't even know how to use them like I have to have someone control it for me when I'm at a computer where someone's using a Wacom tablet um, but I'm like pretty I don't know I think <laughs> once you it's like <laughs> I know how to use a pencil I'm good with using pencil. You know, I think once you're happy with your tools, you tend to kind of use them. And I'm, I'm 
you know, open to learning like new quick techniques, but at the same time, like, because I've been doing what I'm doing for a few years, like I'm really fast at these like not new techniques. So I'm happy kind of with the way it is rather than learning, having to master something else over the course of a year. Jessica, your timing couldn't have been better. These hands are, elast are electric. Just ask that very question if you used a Wacom tablet or not. He or she is obviously addicted to it. Are you aware of any 12-step programs to help that person with their Wacom uh, addiction? <laughs> not that I know of. I'm a, I'm a point and click. I'm a mouse person, so I hold I Sorry, hold these hands are in a really bad way. This is how um, I hold what we're gonna do now. a pencil. Wait, there you go. <laughs> like a that's club. how I hold a pencil. So it's like a club. I get nail marks in my palm, so that's why I don't use a Wacom tablet. Well, for your health, then, uh, it's better that you just stick with the mouse. Um, uh, okay, so we're, we've got a video question here. We're going to take it out. I've been warned his audio was a little loud. We're going to try it anyway. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, buddy. Hello. Hey. Hi, Paul. Am I good? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm my question to to is kind of a kind of a two-parter. First off, is how does your workspace and um, affect your workflow? And then, as part of that, what it was like being in the Swiss Miss Studio. Oh, cool. So I'm no longer in the Swiss Miss Studio. I have a studio in the pencil factory in Brooklyn. Um, so being in the Swiss Miss Studio was awesome because I was around a lot of people that don't do what I do, and I got to learn a lot about, um, can you guys hear me? Just so I know. Um, I got yeah. to learn a lot about web stuff and all this kind of crazy technology stuff that I wouldn't have learned about had I not been there, like learning what Easter eggs were and talking to PHP designers and doing all this kind of stuff that I never really um, was a part of, that a lot of print designers don't really know a lot of web designers, which is a real shame because there's just like so much work that could be going on between them but um so that's what that's one of the things that was really awesome about being in being the swiss miss studio uh, my studio now i'm actually with mostly illustrators which um i used to have a studio in the same um building that i'm in now about two years ago a year and a half ago um, and i just moved back in in june and so it's absolutely like essential for me to have a separate studio space i didn't think that it would be as essential um, but it's pretty impossible for me to work at home now. I have like a cat on my face at any given point and, um, you know, they're like laying across the keyboard and getting off in my business. And also I'm like sitting on the couch watching TV and that is very productive. Um, <laughs> but the, the thing that, the thing that is the best about my current space is that it feels like I'm in the dorms again because it'll be kind of 10 PM and someone's still hanging around and you're like, I don't know, are you working late? Uh, I don't know, are you working late? So you end up working later just because there's like someone else there. That's so, awesome. Russ is, um, Paul, thank Russ you for your question. Right uh, sorry I had to cut off your video because the audio was pretty nuts. Uh, Paul uh, Stonier, uh, awesome guy. You guys look at him up too. He uh, is also part heavily involved in AIGA Upstate New York uh, where he's doing wonderful things for their program. Uh, Paul, thanks again for the question. Um, it looks like we're, we've got one more text question. You guys, if you want to get a question in, this is your last chance. Last call for alcohol, I mean text questions. Uh, Xtian Rios wants to know, how often do you travel and do you like it? Or does traveling suck? And where's your favorite place to travel to? Well, this year I have been traveling a lot. Tomorrow I'm going to Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, for four days for a conference called Design Fest. Um, I was just in Chicago. I was just in Columbus, Ohio in the past month and a half. And uh, I was in New Zealand this summer. I was in Sydney wow. in March. I'm going to Ireland in November. Um, kind of all over the place. Um, I, I love traveling. I love going to new cities, though I am getting a little, a little travel weary right now just because the thing that you don't really like realize when you start booking all these flights is that the week before you go away is just like absolutely insane because you have clients that all know that you're going away and they're being extra crazy and then you mm -hmm. know that you're going away so you try and like cover a lot of bases and uh, you know even just 
I had a client switch a deadline that was supposed to be Friday and now made it tomorrow afternoon, which means I have to do it tonight because I'm going to be on a plane tomorrow afternoon. So it's it gets really nutso with the traveling, and I'm hoping to tone it down a little bit. But I do I do very much like going to different places. Um, we are all extremely jealous of you. Oh, one more text question uh, came up, and uh, we're going to go ahead and take that in a second. Yes, we're all extremely jealous of you. That is amazing. Those experiences have to be priceless. Getting to see so many different places and cultures and Mexico, awesome. Very jealous. Been there once. It was amazing. Um, we're going to take that last text question, and then we're going to wrap this up. Um, Amanda wants to know, is branding-based psychology something you ever consider when designing your lettering? Branding-based psychology. Um, I'm not sure if, like, usually a lot, of, a lot of my lettering stuff is I'm not necessarily the one to brain to, like, be the, the person that came up with the idea, like, especially for advertising stuff, that's, of course, like, they think about it for months and months and then hire me at the last possible moment and then force me to do all the work in, like, a week. But, um, so usually on a lot of, a lot of the lettering stuff that I do, um, the, it's pretty outlined before I get it and, like, what I bring to it is kind of a style thing where I say, you know, like, this is what you want, but it could also be this and I think this, that would also work. So um, I'm not usually starting from scratch unless it's a self-authored project. Um, psychology, hmm, I'm really interested so in psychology. You're not like leaning stuff, back on a couch like, oh, Nike, what is, your, what is your crazy need to inspire everyone to work out? Why are you so needy, Nike? No, no, they're, it's more like they'll write me and say, oh, it's a, you know, we need a logo for this like cool thing that should feel like youth culture or something, something. And I'm like, okay. And then I kind of look around and figure what's, what's happening in that realm that other designers are doing, what's happening that they aren't doing, you know, and kind of figure it out from there. Or like if I was, if I was a teen girl, what would I think was cool? You know, <laughs> wasn't that long ago. So. <laughs> well, um, we're, we're going to wrap it up now. Uh, a couple of, well, first of all, Jessica, um, as you get into these classes at Cooper Type and you start learning about typography and, you know, you, you know, you're around, you're going to be around, well, Stephen Heller is not part of that specific, specific program, but if you bump into any of these people, tell them we say hello. Um, if there's any I way know, we can sure. sneak into the conversation of, of that type school, uh, we think it's amazing. Um, we want to find a way to live vicariously through you because uh, it, it's a very unique experience that you're going to have going through there, and um, we're all very jealous. Um, uh, Michael Holmes in the chat, a chat room wants a Justin Bieber type base. We'll find a way to make that happen I for you, Michael. That. Seriously, it's, that needs to happen. Um, no, it really doesn't. Actually, on second thought, um, no, that doesn't need to happen at all. We don't need a Justin Bieber type face. Um, so, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica, uh, Jessica, for coming on chat room, people. Uh, please check us out on Twitter. We're at Design Chat um, for more announcements about what's going on next week. We have the Post family from Chicago, uh, who is a, a, a design collective of printers and critical thinkers of designers, you know, from different backgrounds. Um, if you don't know who they are, you can look them up postfamily.com or. Um, pick up the typeface movie. They're kind of featured in that, uh, and it's really awesome. So it's going to be another one like quite strong where we've got a bunch of people on, and it's going to be a little bit crazy, but it's going to be fun. Um, so uh, Jessica, thank you, thank you for coming out. Golf clap. Thank you. Hopefully, Good we'll uh, talk to you in the near future. Digital hug. Digital hug. Digital hug. <laughs> Cool. Uh, guys, check in with us next week, and uh, we will talk to you guys soon. Uh, thank you again, Symbolic, for letting us uh, broadcast from your offices, and bye for this week. That's Design Chat.